this story it really creeped me out when I heard about it. So, you know, the thing about prison is, on the one hand, prison is, is just another place to live. You're, you do meet a bunch of scummy people in there, so that's not good. I mean, the chances of me running into a child-molesting cannibal out here is almost zero, but in prison, those chances go considerably up. There are people, a lot of people in prison for, you know, minor crimes, theft, drug possession. I had a friend who was in prison. I, I think it was tax evasion or something like that. And embezzlement is what he went in for. He's a nice guy. So you get, you get a weird mix. But what creeps me out about prison is you can't go anywhere. And you're like, obviously, Jason, that's the point of a prison. But if something goes wrong, you're stuck. Now, you know, I... Like I said, I finished Twin Peaks the other day. There was a scene early on, I think it was episode three of Twin Peaks. There was a man played by Matthew Lillard, oddly enough. There was a lot of cameos in that movie, that or that television show that I didn't expect. But So Matthew Lillard's sitting in a jail cell, crying, just sobbing. And the camera pans over slowly, real slowly, because David Lynch loves to take his time. And the camera pans over real slowly until it goes a couple cells down and there's a hobo painted all black his clothes are pitch black the only thing that is, is visible really is his eyes and he's staring right at the camera and that goes on uncomfortably long and then he turns into a ghost face and starts floating around the cell that scene chilled me to the bone and when you listen to me describe it you're like oh it's kind of ridiculous but it ch- creeped me out because the thing is is that if you're in a prison and there's something like that you're stuck like, I think the worst thing to be would be to be trapped in a haunted prison. I guess there's probably worse things that can happen in prison, but you're in prison and there's a ghost a couple cells down. Like, here, I can, like, leave or I can, like, I don't know, keep the lights on or something. But if you're in a cell and there's, like, a, a monster next to you, there is another jail monster later on in Twin Peaks. That was equally terrifying. He's ripping his face off and yelling the whole time. But, yeah, you're stuck. So when I came across the story of the Black Dog of Newgate, I was like, oh, this is like a great combination of a couple of my fears. I'm not a huge fan of dogs either, but I've gotten better with that. So this story is an old English legend. People say that they still see the black dog of Newgate today, still where that prison is. So the way that the story goes is this. Back during the reign of King Henry III, so we're in England, there was a horrible famine going on. And at the same time, there was this scholar who was accused of being a sorcerer. So he was arrested, and they take him and they throw him into Newgate Prison. And because this famine is going on, the people outside the prison are having a hard time finding food. The last thing that the community, that the society at large is going to worry about is feeding the inmates. So the inmates become cannibals because they're just, you know, they're just, crazy because they need their food another bad reason to go to prison everyone might be a cannibal so this this scholar is thrown in and almost immediately he's descended upon by other inmates and they just tear him to shreds and eat him and they get their little meal for the day maybe they save some maybe they smoke a little bit of them make some jerky but what happens is a couple nights later inmates begin to complain that there is a giant black dog stalking the holes in between the cells and of course you know it's creepy you're trapped in there you're a cannibal you're starving it's pitch black and super hot in there prison's just suck in general and now there's this giant dog walking around your cell and what happens is one night the dog gets into the cell of one of the inmates and just eats him shreds him and everyone's just like oh my god it's like eats him and then a couple nights later it's walking through the cells again snarling big and black blood still dripping off of its fangs from its last meal and it breaks into another cell eats him up and this continues and what happens is they start to put together that he's eating everyone who ate the sorcerer so it's obviously if you had taken a bite of this dude if you someone's like hey man you want a little bit of this scholar no i'm good the dog wasn't going to eat you but if someone's like hey man you want to you want a toe oh yeah dude i'm so hungry i'll totally eat that dude's ugly old dirty toe how dirty was humans back then they'd be the dirtiest cannibals ever anyways like if i was going to cannibalize someone i would want them to like wash them at least put a little deodorant on them Anyway, so the dog's walking and it's eating and eventually like it's this countdown clock. So if you haven't been eaten yet and you know you ate the sorcerer, you're like, dude, we got to get out of here. So there's this huge prison break. A bunch of guards are killed. 
the inmates run out, the dog chases them out. And so even though the inmates get out to freedom, they're out of the prison, they're out of Newgate, they're out of this absolute hellhole. The prison itself was called a prototype of hell. It was just a terrible place to be. They're out into the free English countryside. Yes, there's a famine going on, but at least they don't have to worry about being devoured in their cell by this big black dog. But it continues to stalk them and take them out one by one until finally the last person who ate that sorcerer is killed somewhere in the middle of the night in some lonely English field. This black dog is standing over the last man who took the sorcerer's life and just was eating his guts, killed him, devoured him, got his vengeance, and then left. Now, what's interesting is this was a very popular legend. It was turned into a series of books, you know, because it it ties into everything that we're scared of. We're scared of the unknown. We're scared of the evil in humanity. We're scared in retribution. We also like the idea of people who do evil acts are eventually punished for them. The book itself that's based on this is told by a narrator. And the book itself is interesting because it's very clickbaity. So it's interesting. So the book itself says the story that you just read is 100% fake. And the narrator of the story of the Black Dog in Newgate Prison is going, the only Black Dog I know of is the one that stands at limbo. The one that sits there and kills the condemned prisoners. The ones that when you were imprisoned in life, when you go to limbo, your brains are dashed out from all of your horrible things that you've done. Now, right there you'd go, well, that's kind of clickbaity. It's kind of clickbaity, like I'm reading this whole book, I'm reading this wood carving book, so I'm getting like splinters, because I know that's not what a wood carving is, but you know, I'm looking at this book that has pictures of made from wood carvings, and you get to the end and you're like, what? It's all fake, that's lame. But this legend is actually older than the book. So, it, it, I mean, it could be one of those stories that's completely made up. It's most likely not 100% factually true. But I I think there's this, it it does play into a lot of those things that we find creepy. And they say the legend even predates the book. This idea of prisoners committing some sort of atrocity against a man and then his vengeful spirit coming back. Nowadays people go, the ghost still stalks the prison and you can look up sometimes and see the shape moving and all that stuff. I think that's tourist trappy stuff. But I think the real truth might lay somewhere in between. The real truth of a man being wronged in prison and and taking vengeance against his captors. And then the other side of the truth, a man being killed in prison and bringing about the form of this black dog to take vengeance on his his enemies. I think the real truth probably lays somewhere in between there. I'm not the type of person to say it's 100% impossible for someone to conjure up some sort of creature to take vengeance on their enemies. I will say I think it's incredibly unlikely. I think that it's probably not super common, but I'm also not going to say it's absolutely impossible because I think there's a lot of stuff that can happen. I think this story itself is very entertaining. I wouldn't put money on it. That was true. And I'm not buying a plane ticket to go out to England to see a big black blur standing on top of a prison. But if anyone ever asks me, hey, do you know any creepy stories about you know, black dogs, I tell them this one. And, you know, that's one thing. I wanted to wrap the episode up with this. I said during my episode about Ted Bundy's ghost, I was like, stuff needs to be better sourced. This is completely ridiculous and all that stuff. There's a, And, and I, I think I need to clarify something. There's a difference between an interesting ghost story, a creepy ghost story, and a story that purports itself to be true. When someone tells me a creepy ghost story... They're not trying to convince me that ghosts exist, generally. They're trying to scare me. And that's totally fine. That's a form of entertainment. This story, the Newgate story, is a story that's supposed to be a morality tale. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not going, what, what cell was he in? What's the name of the scholar? Because that's not the point of the story. The Psychology Today article, unless, I mean, I read it multiple times, unless they were trying to be tongue-in-cheek, I didn't pick up on it. And the person who wrote the article has written books about ghosts and crime scenes and stuff like that. The Psychology Today article was trying to be more factual. There there wasn't really a creepy ghost story. It was trying to say Ted Bundy is floating around here. And you can call it, you know, I think the headline was, Is Ted Bundy's Ghost Still Haunting Us? That actually might have been my headline. But you know what I mean? Like, you can crib it differently. 
So I love creepy ghost stories, but if you want me to believe in ghosts, you want me to believe in UFOs, you're going to have to source it. And I think maybe that distinction was last in that last episode, so I wanted to clarify that. I don't have a problem with creepy ghost stories, but if you want people to believe in this stuff, source them. This story is just to creep us out. It's just to teach us a lesson. And hopefully, hopefully, it teaches a lesson that you shouldn't eat people who know more than you do. Don't eat scholars. If you're going to eat someone, eat like a hobo. Or eat like, I don't know, someone who had like barely passed math. I don't know. That's not good because I barely passed math. That was a clip from our daily podcast, Dead Rabbit Radio. Dead Rabbit Radio is available anywhere that you listen to podcasts. It's daily paranormal, conspiracy, and true crime news. If you want to hear the full episode that this clip came from, check the link below. Please like and subscribe. And hit that little bell, too. That does some magical stuff. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.